We are checking in with a state representative, Tacky Chan of Quincy, for another Tacky Talk podcast here in the last week of March, Tacky. I know. It's a long month of March. It's a five Friday month. And actually, April is going to be long, too. It's a five Monday month. Hmm. Okay. Be prepared. Hopefully, the weather will get better by then. <laughs> well, it is uh, March 26, as you pointed out. And uh, looking, as you can see over the screen, to the window, and it's still gray, cloudy, and windy. I was uh, joking earlier this month with the concept of uh, of the old song, not kind of saying that we always use in school is that March winds, April showers, bring you many flowers. Well, March is delivering on the wind. Yeah, it's uh, technically the windiest month, according to the people at the Blue Hill Weather Observatory. So it's living up to its uh, name for sure. Yeah, it's making my sinus a little bit bonky as you can hear a bit of a nasalness on my side. Uh, uh, the, the sudden uh, warmth last week and, you know, sudden chill out. Uh, this weekend and through the weekend. Of course, we had another major rainstorm on Saturday. Uh, you know, those are some flooding in the city, but it we seem to be um, no worse than where is the city and DPW did a great job keeping up with the, the water. Yeah, I didn't hear anything major, thankfully. So let's hope that continues uh, throughout the spring and hopefully things start to dry out here soon. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Uh, I'm a Monday gar garbage day, so I'm sure... You've all had the same experience I did regarding recyclables and other stuff blowing in the wind around your house. Exactly. My recyclables is the neighbors. Uh, so anything going on on Beacon Hill we should know about? Well, uh, right now we're meeting uh, Chairman Ways and Means. I had my meeting last Wednesday. Actually, tomorrow, a Wednesday's House Asian Caucus meeting. Um, we are... We see still in conversations at this point. Um, the House and Senate passed a variation of a um, supplemental budget, which transfers more uh, opera money to address the migrant crisis, as well as uh, some other issues of pandemic era policies we talked about, such as outdoor dining, take alcohol, remote uh, community meetings, and so forth, and uh, city and town uh, public meetings. Um, and it's uh, it may be going to conference committee. Uh, maybe in a couple of days. So um, typical uh, operating procedure right now in the legislature where uh, neither side can agree on a single bill uh, before it goes to the floor. So, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the, the buzz right now is trying to figure out you know, what, what's going to really happen there in terms of negotiations. And from the membership standpoint, time is running short. The fiscal year ends July 31st. That's going to come up on us really, really fast. Yeah, I know that the the uh, revenge porn bill was part of that uh, package that got approved, and Senator Keenan, one of the main sponsors of that, so I'm sure he was happy to see that. Well, we sent them a revenge porn bill separately back at the beginning of the year, so I get it. I mean, it's a budget; you can package thing into it, but you know, the Senate, you know, the Senate had opportunity to debate the bill independently as opposed to wrap it into a larger piece. Mm. I get it. Uh, but, you know, from the House's position, you know, we gave you a bill. Why don't you debate the bill we gave you? Speaking of the uh, migrant crisis, I had some changes announced, I guess, yesterday by the state in terms of um, trying to get folks out of the emergency system um, and into the mainstream. Well, it, this is kind of a compounding problem, right? I mean, we want folks to get uh, out of the uh, emergency shelters, uh, move them on to work permit uh, reduce the need for social services. And of course we have a housing shortage. So it's like the perfect storm of problems hitting at once. Uh, the big one of course is the work permits. You hear about this all the time from us in the news. You can't get people to work and you can't get them to sustain themselves. It ain't complicated. You got no work permit, you can't work. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're gonna do it illegally uh, under the table and the consequences of not contributing to social security and taxes and that that's unacceptable so you know as we continue to repeat ourselves the federal government loves us a problem the federal government's in charge of work permits so they're not you know helping out here and create an expedited system um and the sooner we are able to keep that moving along the better uh you know like remind folks we still have all these other refugees here beyond the migrant issue we have ukrainians we do have Haitian refugees that are not migrants. We do have uh, Afghans. And I didn't know we had the Bhutanese. That's uh, people from Bhutan. And uh, we'll be seeing at some point probably some people from Myanmar, which 
that humanitarian civil war crisis continues uh, in that country. So uh, again, this country's uh, always been welcoming to refugees and uh, the state in particular. Uh, but no one tells us when people show up, which doesn't help. We don't know how many show up, and we don't know where they're going to be because the federal government is in charge of placement. And the migrant issue is a uh, reflection of the fact they process them in the border. Uh, they're giving uh, temporary legal status, and they kind of let them go where they want to go as opposed to some kind of plan about, you know, maybe should process work permits when they're processing them to give temporary legal status? Just saying. Right. They could go work anywhere at that point. Yeah, and it kind of takes some pressure off of everyone because we know uh, people that are looking for work will go to places that need workers. And, uh, you know, thanks to the Internet and cell phones, you know, over time, that's that's what happens. It's it's the great American uh, work part. It's, you know, Americans can go anywhere in the country to work. If you've got a work permit or you're a citizen, you got a social security number, you got a number, you can work anywhere in the U.S. that's willing to take you. Uh, mm -hmm. And people who are looking for work gravitate towards work. Uh, it's always been the case in this country. That's that's how it goes. It's not like other places where the, you know countries are small. You have a trading block like the EU, which you know broke down barriers on, on work permitting because they want to be more like us in terms of migration, work, and uh, stimulate economic development all over the continent. But you go to other uh, places, they try to limit people from entering cities, for example, because that's what economic centers are. Uh, because of overcrowding. So a part of capitalism uh, and uh, actually of First Amendment rights uh, as the Commerce Clause rights, you know, as a freedom of travel in the U.S. Yeah, you don't need a passport to go to Rhode Island. <laughs> but this is a colonial thing, right? This is actually was a conversation, you know, during the colonial era about whether or not you're right. Absolutely right. You need a passport to go to Rhode Island from Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a real conversation back in the founding of the country, whether or not right. about 13 currencies, 13 passports, 13 tariffs, you know, 13 different standards of uh, of commerce and travel. Uh, and uh, this country at the very onset decided that, you know, for the benefit of the whole, states would give up individual rights uh, as sovereign entities in exchange of a, of a greater good of a country. And here we are today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is something we take for granted. Not everybody can do what we do in terms of migration around the U.S. Um, you know, I have friends that left the state a uh, long, long time ago, and it's just because of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and some for schooling. They went to other states to go to school, and you know, they found out they liked living in those states, and they never came back. Um, something you can do in this country. Um, and, of course, in Massachusetts, is interested in retaining uh, our workforce, uh, which means retaining students. Right. It's it funny you mentioned that. I was just reading a story this morning uh, about the migration of young people out, mainly the center city of Boston, you know, because of the high cost of living. Yeah, I, was, I got to try to record an article. There was an article regarding what it takes for a single person to live in each city of the U.S. And, of course, Boston is among the top 10 uh, most expensive. I want to say it's like one hundred twenty nine thousand ish dollars, something like that. That sounds that right. Yeah. Single person, if you're single and got to live just on basics. I mean, no vacations, no retirement savings, just to get by. It's I think it's one hundred twenty nine something thousand dollars. And uh, I remember about six years ago, it was only ninety thousand dollars was the number, and that was appalling six years ago. So. Um, you know, I know that, you know, we have a lot of high tech jobs and, you know, white collar jobs, but, you know, these kids are also sat of uh, high debt in some cases. And, um, you know, you got to, to really just, you know, try to live, you know, as an independent individual yourself, no roommates, no girlfriend, no boyfriend, no partners, not depending on your parents. It is very hard. Yeah, no question for sure. And, um, you know, it's the only, I think there's only so much government can do to address that. A lot of it is determined by the market. Oh, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is. this is a market-driven system uh, on real estate. And you're all aware there's been talk about rent control over and over and over again. Uh, and, you know, I was trying to learn the lessons of pre-1994, particularly in Boston and Cambridge, where the last, you know, truly the last spaces left uh, in the state of rent control as everyone moved away from rent control in the decades. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, it's, these are, we, we always, I talk to folks about this in the state house and, 
you know, they all want these safeguards regarding, you know, how much you can increase. They want accountability, livability, uh, livability. You know, try to avoid slum lords because, you know, you're paying the cent rent for 30 years and you can't keep up with the cost of maintaining the property because what you pay and the, and the property cost increases they don't match up. Uh, but property taxes are wacky because it's uh, constantly changing due to housing construction and lack of commercial property, depending where you are, which shifts the cost. Every time you lose commercial property, shifts property tax costs onto the residential customers. I mean, it's just, duh. I mean, you lose a commercial a space rent uh, based property taxes and, you know, it shifts the other way to, to residential. So, you know, you know, I've talked about this rent control issues and we got all these other dynamics on trying to control rent, including unpredictability of taxes. Um, you know, the cost of utilities keep shifting around, especially water, especially water. Uh, mm. so that, that keeps, you know, pumping up. I think all of you are looking at your water bill. Well, exactly what I'm saying. Um, and it's, it's, I wish it was easier to say, yeah, we just set the rent prices by the government and off you go. And it's not as simple as that because you still have to take in consideration of habitability and changing cost of property. And everybody here listening that pays utility bills, water bills, property taxes, um, you know, and then you have to pay for cost of maintenance, depending you know how long you live in your home. We're not talking about like refurbishing the kitchen, we're saying like changing the roof. You have shingles, for example. Um, you're trying to, you know, have a heating system or cooling system reaching the end of lifespan, or maybe have like a pipe burst or something like that. I mean, these are real costs that everyone faces. And uh, you know, this is about whether you have like a two or three family or you have like a 60 or 100 unit apartment building. Right, right. Um Speaking of uh, utility cost, uh, National Grid is looking for an increase in their distribution rates, I think. And is that something that the state eventually would have to approve? Yeah, the process is that the National Grid would put a request to the Department of Public Utilities, the DPU, for a rate increase in the distribution system. They would have to justify the rate increase by demonstrating that, that it's a, a cost of, they need to do the cost of doing business. And uh, the Attorney General's Office, Office of Repair Advocacy, would investigate the case on behalf of ratepayers, and uh, discovery will begin on the uh, cost that National Grid uh, is saying they need to spend on, you know, capital infrastructure, office, uh, you know, cost of doing business, like what else, salaries, health insurance, things like that, uh, expenses, uh, and then they want a rate of return because, uh, you may not realize this, but the utility bill is not 100% by you, 100% paid by you. It's actually a lot of uh, private uh, shareholders as well as public shareholders uh, money that's basically fronting uh, your capital improvements, maintenance costs, and so forth on your behalf. So you know there is a shareholder cost as well as private um, entities that have investments in the business and also uh, bonds. Right? They have to borrow money take loans out to maintain the system. So you, know, you actually have to pay the interest back and the repairs pay that back. So, you know, there's, you know, need some profit, obviously, and they have ready to return. And whenever you have like a major storm event, um, you know, the money isn't there right away. It isn't like this, this you know, magic storage of money. I mean, they, they have to only charge you what they're going to do for services. So they float loans out, and not surprising that sometimes they're all selling their shares, uh, privately held shares in company into the public market to get some money to cover some costs, and then you know to buy back shares or you know what not they have to do to to maintain share prices. So it's pretty intricate, as you can tell. It's you know the, the ability for public utilities to to get money um, in emergency situations, you know, the ratepayers you know, have to help flip some of the costs. So mm. it's a lot of moving parts uh, involved in this, uh, and it's distribution rates. It's the small wires, not the big wires. So the wires in front of your home are what I call the distribution small wires, the mega size wires that are like 200, 300 feet in the air. Uh, those are the transmission lines, which is a separate charge. Um, and of course we don't do energy to the uh, national grid or NSTAR. We don't do utility company. That's all private market. Um, the utility comes to provide basic rate, which is like every six months they will bid for a rate uh, in the competitive marketplace. And if you're not part of a private non-utility energy supplier, you're automatically going to be a utility supplier because they still require to ensure that you get electricity. Mm. Uh, and the standard is um, 
safe and reliable service at a reasonable cost. That is the legal standard. So uh, you know, it will take about three months-ish to, to complete this investigation and the EPA to make a ruling on the rate. And not surprising, I mean, the AG's office will ask for low and the utility will ask for high and the DP will try to find somewhere in middle ground that justifies the rate increase pursuant to the evidence provided. Yeah, so I, as you know, here in Quincy, the city is looking to a municipal aggregation aggregation uh, policy or procedure. So buying electricity in bulk and then reselling it, is that how that would work? Well, uh, actually that's been approved uh, by the DPU with some caveats the city has to comply. There was some, looks like based on what I read, there was some application problems on the forms, which are not um, fatal, not mm -hmm. fatal issues so the city has to do some small corrections it looks like and then they can go into the market to bid for energy and then the city will be locked in for a term of years on the energy and then those uh, you'll be buying uh, energy from a private supplier uh, that is not the utility that the city put a bid out on uh, to get a price uh, it is a opt-out system it is not an opt-in system so once the city uh, is able to get that contract locked down you will get a letter uh, from the city telling you that, hey, we got energy from X company. This is the rate. This is the rate they'll increase on a yearly basis if there is one, uh, depending on the contract. Maybe it's just flat rate for X period of time. If you want to participate, you don't have to do anything. If you want to get out of it, go back to the utility or find your own uh, private um, energy supplier. We have to write back or fill out the form or whatever to opt out. Um, my advice to everyone is wait until you see what the city has to offer uh, because you know, once they complete that process, we'll see it. And then uh, you're obviously able to look at your electric bill for the basic service rate, which I will bet the city can get a lower price than. Uh, and then you can also uh, go on the internet. Uh, the state has a website uh, to provide, which I don't remember off the top of my head as you can tell, but we do have a website that uh, does price comparisons of some of the biggest energy suppliers uh, in the country that is legally allowed to sell electricity in Massachusetts and there are few mixtures. So, you know, if you want, you know, large quantity of windmill power, mm. you, can, you can get a summary on the website of where the basics are. Uh, and like cable television and, and uh, cell phones, uh, there's introductory offers. Right. So be cautious, you know, just like cell of KBT, there's that introductory offer at a slower rate, and then it'll pop up to a rate. Right, and, it locks you in too, so you do need to be, read read all the all the fine print, yeah. In terms of contract, there's also a big part too, whether it's an auto renewal. So, you know, given, you know, I generally would advise folks to start hunting for electrical prices soon because the summer ones are coming up quickly, although again, long month of March, long month of April, yeah. or psychologically. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the prices will start shifting because the price of oil and gas will shift as we head into summer and the energy prices will shift with them. I don't know how long the city is going to take regarding uh, this bid process. It is not uh, as simple as it sounds just saying put an RFP. You actually have to do some research, as you can tell, talk, listening to me, you know, researching uh, energy uh, suppliers, but also understanding uh, the uh, shifting energy market regarding uh, both fossil fuels and renewable power mm -hmm. sources is a constant moving target. It isn't like a window is always going to give you the same rate of power every single day. I mean, it's it's always a moving target. So, um, you know, it's kind of a work in progress. And so when I get our get my letter, um, mm -hmm. have a conversation about said letter about how you should all read it. But until I get in my hand, I can't uh, can't tell exactly what's going to look like. Yeah, yeah. So who would you pay? Who would you pay? Do you, do you pay the city? Do you pay the utility? How does that work? It would be through the utility. Okay. It should be it should be a single bill um, because the bill uh, utility bill system should be able to identify the city of Quincy, obviously, and then subdivide out, you know, the pass-through costs and passes through utility. It will be a separate, could it be a separate bill? Absolutely could be a separate bill. So the you know energy charge would disappear off your national grid bill, and instead you get a separate bill for electrical usage. Uh, okay. But but you only got one meter, and the meter is in front of your house, and the meter is owned by the utility. Right. So in theory, you know, you could get a separate charge, but it involves the utility measuring the electricity to your, coming out of your home. Then 
sending information to the supplier who then has to bill you separately. It, you can see the accounting um, challenges there. So it's, you know, somewhat easy just to, you know, utility do it and then just tell the supplier like, hey, you know, this is what's been used, what's your rate? And right. then, Attack it onto your bill, so it can be done more than one way. But uh, yeah, the most um, efficient way would be uh, the utility. Okay, yeah, I know it's been done in Boston for years. I know, so it's not it's not nothing new. It's and certainly it can you know can be done. It's, it's there's already a system set up for it. Yeah, and you know the ability to get a bulk rate on the city of Quincy as a, as on a whole should give us a very competitive price because, you know, there's, what, 204,000 people here, mm -hmm. you know, 60,000-ish properties, um, and they all use electricity, obviously. So, you know, given the bulk purchasing ability, you know, you should get a better rate than the basic rate by utility, and it would be very competitive if you go into private market yourself. Um, but you know, the city also needs to consider, does it want to use a, a different fuel mixture or do they just want the lowest rate? Do they want to have like 20% fossil? Do they want 70% renewable? I, I don't know what to think. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's something that can be part of the, the city process uh, to mm -hmm. look at what you want to do. And again, you have to know the energy market because the energy market fluctuates. So you got to know when to put the RP in the sense you got to take your best guess. Right. So for example, gasoline, I don't even know this, is somewhere between 307 and 315 in the inside the city area. You go to Boston, it's closing in like 360 and going up more, which means the energy markets shifted really quickly in the last two months uh, regarding oil in particular. And, um, you know, what does the city go in now to put a bid in or do they wait a little longer? And, you know, are they, want, are they going to be monitoring the price of uh, solar and wind, um, you know, on a national level inside the ISO actually not national, inside the ISO New England grid because you can only really buy power that's part of the uh, states that are connected to the same part of the grid. Right, right. Like yeah. I can't buy California power. You really can't because California is not connected to our section of the grid, which is the east. Well, actually central to central to east and north and southern Canada. That's part of okay. the hmm. Yeah, you really need somebody expert in that field, I think, to at least advise you on how to do it. Yeah, it's well worth the money to to mm -hmm. find a person that has a lot of experience in this, uh, because you know whatever you pay the person will be a uh, savings for homeowners. Right, exactly. Hmm. Okay, something to look forward to. Just another form to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep out that letter from the city. And like I said, once we uh, once I get my letter, I'm happy to sit here. And we can go through it if you want. Yeah, I think that'd be worthwhile. Actually, a lot of people have questions, I'm sure, and and um, maybe it would be helpful. You never know. You never know. Sometimes I know something, sometimes I don't, as I like to tell people. <laughs> um, hey, what's going on with the MBTA lately, Tacky? Oh, well, the T is still having uh, problems. It's so the new derailments are happening, uh, and it's unfortunate. And this continues to be a long-term maintenance issue of neglect. Uh, again, I still go back to Beverly Scarred. I know she's not the sole problem, but you know, all it takes is one bad GM and the whole thing goes to pot pretty quick, particularly the maintenance issue. Uh, saving money by not doing maintenance is not smart. And also damage from snowstorms over time. I mean, Snowzilla did a number in the entire system. I know it was 2015, but hmm. that, stuff, that stuff catches up in the old man because, you know, we have snow, we have cold, we have heat, you know, and, uh, you know, it's metal. And, you know, you've got very old electrical systems on top of the blue line and, in parts of the green line, so and parts of the orange line. So, as we've seen in the news, we, you know, it's been plagued by uh, maintenance issues and whether they just keep up with everything that's going on. The red line is slowly but steadily coming back to normal, but you know, slowly and steady. It's not like it's going to happen in a hot minute. And then there's be public hearings going on soon regarding the MBTA lower fare rate for income folks. We have a discount fares for students or discount fares for senior citizens and they want to propose putting out a discount fare for people 200 percent of the federal poverty level we'll see how that plays out and the t also needs a new uh, fair system charlie's system is antiquated and charlie's system is terrible i mean we're by the way we're a low bid state just to keep it you know remember folks we're a low bid state so we take the uh, lowest bid as long as it meets the standards of the contract. We don't take the best technology available regardless of cost. 
And technology is not like buying paper clips. You get what you pay for. So I'm not, I mean, no taxpayer or ratepayer or customer wants to pay more than you have to. Right. But you do get what you pay for in the local state process. Um, you may find better tech you can do the same work as the lesser tech, uh, which, but the lesser tech is the lowest bid. Does seem kind of counterintuitive to cut fares when they're already looking at a huge deficit. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is the problem. I mean, the COVID recovery has been slow. People are still working from home. Commuter Rail, you know, you've seen Commuter uh, Rail uh, problems. You saw them in other. Uh, Camaro hit a tractor trailer on the Fitchburg line, which again, very scary of how you need to clear the crossing. I still am always shocked that uh, vehicles can't figure out, and people can't figure out that blinking lights mean something's going to happen. Uh, and I do know that intersection has some issues regarding the gate, but there is like blinkers and noise. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's like train horn. I'm, I'm good. I'm just saying. So, you know, I can't blame everything on the MBTA. I mean, there is a human component to some of this stuff too. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, it's you know, some of it is a, you know human factors. Um, but you know, the T is you know recovery mode. And but I want to remind folks before COVID, when the T was packed like sardines, uh, you're not making more money because you can't put in more people in the train, and in the and you can't put more trains because you can't. Uh, add more uh, cars to a train because of the way the tunnel system's kind of this windy old tunnel system plus the platforms aren't long enough. Mm -hmm. You have to expect having a platform inside the tunnels. There's no more space to put platforms. Plus the fact that you got a winding tunnel. So um, there is a point where you can only add so many cars and you can only squeeze so many trains between uh, between time frames safely. There's emergency, as we know it's constantly emergency on the train. You want to get enough break time for the train behind you so you don't cause a crash. Right. So you can't like cram them like five minutes apart. I mean, if they're like five minutes apart, and God forbid, and the train's in front and the one's coming up behind you at 40 miles an hour. And you guys all look, hopefully remember your physics lessons. You know, a lot of mass and speed you know, takes a long time to slow down. So, you know, the T really is a combination of issues where, um, you know, before COVID, you already packed to the gills. Costs don't go down. Costs have obviously gone up. You all feel the same cost we, you know, we're feeling, and the T feels the same cost you are feeling. And uh, yeah, I have a lot of scratching head moments about this low income fare proposal. Mm. Um, we'll see. We'll see uh, what the public, uh, what the public hearings are like, and whether or not the T can figure out the math. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know we haven't talked about in a while, Techie, is um, ballot questions, and if any have been certified, uh, what we're looking at in the fall. Well, I mean, we have the special committee. There's a special joint committee on ballot questions that is out there. Um, I'm trying to remember who chairs it. I think it's Representative uh, Leader uh, Paish, and I think it's Cindy Freeman, I think, in the Senate. Um, I'm trying to remember. But, you know, we had set up a separate special joint committee to look at just the ballot questions. Yeah. Let's see if we can remember this correctly. We have the minimum wage increase regarding restaurant workers, tip service workers. We have the so-called ride share um, contractor um, law change, which is, is both issues actually very complicated. We have the state auditor trying to get a uh, change in the law to audit the legislature. Uh, I still believe we have a separation problem, separation of powers problem, this is a constitutional issue. And then you uh, got uh, psychedelics, which yeah. are jokingly called magic mushrooms. If you're old enough to know what I'm saying, you. You probably know exactly what I'm saying if I say the words magic mushrooms, but you know psychedelics have proven you know, to some um, effectiveness uh, at John Hopkins research regarding a lot of uh, mental health issues and you know chemical imbalances. So, not say it's a perfect drug. I'm not saying it's a drug that's a miracle worker, but you know people are looking at this uh, as something we should legalize uh, to do more research. But no one can explain the ballot question to me because I. That's one question I've talked to some folks about, and they're like, "We don't understand how this would work." Okay, it just it wouldn't just legalize them. No, there's like a whole regulatory process. No one knows how it oh, works. Okay, and to be honest with you, stuff like that, you know, John Hopkins is doing research. I mean, you need a medical profession, right? Yeah, you can't just like self medicate. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's not going to be like uh, you know recreational marijuana. 
uh, mushroom shops popping up all over. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think the intention is to provide it as medical, you know, medical, um, uh, medical uh, assistance, uh, mm -hmm. pharmaceutical, but. Um, at least I don't understand how this legislation works. I we all look at it like I don't understand which way this thing's heading. Other facts are looking to legalize psychedelics. So I believe those are the four ballot questions, unless I'm missing one. No, I think you got them all. I, but I was curious, have they all been certified or are they all definitely going to appear? Do you know? Well, the legislature has to the beginning of May to pass them into law, basically being on the governor's has signed a law. We historically have not done that. Uh, no, we just don't do that. Um, and then they would have to go get more signatures to get on the ballot uh by august oh, I see. And, then, and, and if they make the ballot question um signature requirement you know it's on to november and um you all and me have a chance to vote in the ballot box what we think of these i see okay gotcha so it's they're still in the in the, in the developing process yeah and they all uh, should have a ballot ballot petition uh campaign accounts at mm -hmm. the office of campaign political finance and you know the question is: Is there going to be big money coming in as independent expenditures advocating for and against these ballot questions? Independent expenditure uh, uh, packs are not just regarding candidates; you can use them for ballot questions by third-party industries. So, um, yeah, I'd be curious how this puts out in terms of uh, who can get the next set of signatures, but also, um, you know, what money is involved uh, kind of clues you in exactly you know where the interest comes from. Yep, absolutely. Sure. It was just like the, well, the so-called right to repair law that, you know, happened a few years ago. Well, it was heavily funded by a third party, third party manufactured part company. Right. Funded by your car repair shop down the street. It was predominantly right. funded by third party manufactured parts, as well as the supersized car uh, repair shops. I mean, the, the, the big chains nationally mm -hmm. uh, were pushing their ballot questions. So, I mean, you know, they don't actually have it advertised truthfully, guys. I mean, they can advertise whatever you want regarding these questions. They, there is no law saying you have to be honest about it. Mm. So, you know, this, this, you know, when you saw these small um, businesses, you know, maybe, yeah, they contributed some money, but they weren't exactly pumping in a hundred grand. No, they can't. That's not, not, not in their business model to be able to do that, right? Yeah. So where did the money come from, right? So... You know, we always known that third party part manufacturers were funding those ballot questions. Mm -hmm. um, do you know, Tacky, that you know the federal government just passed their spending bill to so the government wouldn't shut down? Um, anything in that for Quincy? Do you know, or or Massachusetts for that matter? Um, I can't say for sure what's actually in there. I mean, obviously, you can ask the federal delegation. I know that there was um, some various grant monies uh, in there uh, for different um, programs that not-for-profits, you know, municipalities can apply for, but it hasn't been authorized yet. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, you know, you can talk to Philip Chung at Queen's Asian Resources, but they had a CDC grant day uh, one. They were able, they got approved, uh, but it wasn't funded yet. So, the, you know, as part of this funding package, you know, to set whatever grant programs that the government agreed to that, you know, it's an ongoing program or a new program that's under law, you know, has been funded. So, you know, Queen's Asian Resources were waiting for, you know, this federal funding to come through. And, you know, now it has, I mean, obviously it has to go through the, the comptroller and all the various, you know, bureaucratic uh, mechanisms of accounting, but, you know, they're going to get their money uh, now or not now, but soon. Um, I yeah. think that was approved yeah. last summer. Oh, okay. If I remember correctly. So, you know, they need until the reauthoriz until the authorization of the budget, uh, they were kind of like just waiting it out. Mm. Uh, I always remind folks, I mean, when it comes to fundraising for, uh, you know, charitable organizations, the government is probably not your first choice source for steady income, to be honest with you. It's, yeah, it gets mired down in the political process and you can't really count on it. Well, and the federal government, inability to A, have a budget, because mm. they don't you'd have continuing, revolution, continuing re res resolutions of spending. That's not a budget. That's just like... Stop, guys. They have eight of these resolutions they've had uh, since the George W. Bush administration. The last budget that was approved, I think, may have been the end of Clinton, the first year of George W. Uh, wow. That's how long it's been since the federal government had like a budget budget uh, where you didn't have to do continuing resolutions. This was your spending and this was it. And um, 
end of story. Um, but yeah, no, they've been, you know, functioning well in actual budget budget for a very long time on these continuing resolutions. And, uh, you know, it's it's kind of how it works down there. And everyone's always in pins and needles. And I talked to a couple of friends that have been in the feds for a very long time. And a lot of people are thinking about leaving again because, you know, this uncertainty of whether you could get paid. Uh, yeah, it's the federal government. You have a job, but you may not get paid now. And you may go for who knows how long we'll go pay. So a lot of people are rethinking their careers at this point because it's gone on for too many years, too long, you know, in this kind of behavior. Interesting. Hmm. Wait, you like the idea that you don't ever going to get paid next week and you might have to wait? Who knows? Yeah, it's unsettling, I'm sure, especially if you have a family you're trying to support. Yeah. Yeah, it used to be like the most steady gig ever. We we'll work for the feds, and, you know, for the last 20 plus odd years. Uh, it doesn't seem to be that way. Um, and continuing resolutions, you can ask Steve Lynch or, one, or, or Senator Marcus, Senator Warren, but you know, my always understanding is continuing resolutions lets them to work outside of a balanced budget. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I wonder why the deficit's out of control. That's correct. I mean, if you have a budget submission to Congress, it has to be a balanced budget, or at least a balanced budget, you know, with the intention of borrowing because you're going to be a bloated budget or out of balanced budget. We can, you know, you can create some surety uh, to the public that you know we're going to take this on debt because the budget's this size, but we know what the debt's going to look like because you know, well, we don't know because of the interest rates, but we know we have to borrow X amount plus interest. Right. That's not what's going on here. I mean, right now they're unlike us, the state right now, the Congress is just like, hey, you know, we got these eight resolutions for different sectors of government. You know, let's add and remove stuff. We'll put amendments of public policy, take amendments off of public policy, change laws as they're doing it like in one document. And then, you know, they can do supplemental budgets or, you know, agency uh, money transfers, which we do as well. Uh but I mean, you also don't have line and veto. So the president can, you know, wholesale reject or, or keep. And Reagan was probably one of the most famous ones. Ronald Reagan rejected a budget uh, because he wanted to get his tax package done and force Congress to negotiate. So, you know, neither branch, uh, and neither party, uh, regardless if it's a single party in three branches or not, has been able to put together um, a budget budget like you see in state governments or corporations or not-for-profits or you at home. And I'm always amazed that the public can see, seem to like know that they don't have like an annual budget. And again, your budget may be out of balance, right? You need to borrow, but at least you know what you're borrowing subject right. to interest. Right. Yeah. At the state level, you, you, you have to have a balanced budget by law. <laughs> That's correct. I mean, we either have to find money from the rainy fund, rob from a trust fund, so to speak, uh, you know, do count transfers to you know, balance different parts of the budget, or we have to straight up cut. And the government did nine C cuts in December, you know, to try to get ahead of a potential budget shortfall projection. And uh, you know, we have a lot of mechanisms uh, to to move money around, you know, draw money from from backup, and also just straight up cut. And uh, you know, we're already warning folks that next fiscal year's budget projections are being very very conservative and. You know, we're trying to temper expectations next year. And, um, you know, we've had some pretty flush years in terms of a good economy starting around 2016. We've had a good run of a strong economy. And, of course, COVID was weird. But, you know, we had backfill Fed money. And then the Fed, you know, putting a lot of stimulus into, like, almost every other sector of the economy, which Massachusetts is going to benefit from. And uh, but you know that takes time for that stuff to trickle down to you know tax dollars. It isn't like we're going to dump you know a billion dollars into a public works project. You know, you don't see the entire economic impact in one day. That's that's a trickle through day. So I mean, for us in terms of like tax revenue, we have to wait for the jobs to get created and then you know pay and people get paid more and the whole thing you know ripples through. So you know it's it's a it's a steady process. Um, and you know, very uncertain economy for you know nothing makes sense the last three years from my step. Uh, and I've been watching you know economic stuff since '95, yeah. uh, my first budget in '96 uh, as a staffer. So I have I just can't explain it. I just don't understand the the economics of this. And economists use historical records to try to predict the future, and I don't think we can still. No, I think we're we're setting some uh, some new parameters uh, these past couple of years for sure to go forward on. 
yeah, researchers in a couple of years' time are going to look back at this time period and try to decipher exactly what was going on in, in, in our economy in the U.S., but also the global level. It's going to take a bit of time for that to unravel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what's coming up in your committee uh, this year, Techie? Not a lot. I mean, we're still waiting for bills to get a referral to next committee, you know, steering policy, ways and means, a third reading. I mean, I'm waiting for stuff to move around. Uh, so I'm a little annoyed that it's been six weeks and I don't know why I don't know my own bills, much less the committee bills, don't know why they are not leaving the clerk's office to second space. It's out of my control. But I'm getting a little annoyed as, as it's hard to work if you don't know what committee to advocate to next. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You need to be able to see the road in front of you before you can drive. <laughs> That's correct. I mean, you know, we have the same uh, bill tracking system you see on the internet. My internal system updates at the same time the public system does. So I don't have any special more insight than you have because we're using the same system essentially. And, uh, you know, once it leaves joint committee, it has to go to another committee, whether it be a committee of referral or committee of next review. And you can't advocate to another committee if the bill... We don't know where the bill is. So uh, as you can tell from how I'm talking, I'm a bit frustrated here uh, that, that me and the staff are unable to do our job uh, if we don't know where the bill is yet. Um, so we, you know, we have a, you know, another public hearing probably going to get set up, but it's only going to be for one late file bill, it looks like. And we have some whole petitions, again, these liquor license requests from cities and towns to try to get past the quota. Uh, and we're reviewing those, and uh, we've been doing those by um, letter testimony only. And uh, we're in the joint route 10 now. So, you know, just to do a little review, the joint route 10, the day the bill hits my committee, I have 30 days to have a public hearing and take an action on the bill. And the action could be also including an extension order on the bill. So, I mean, hopefully I don't get like, well, actually I prefer to get like six or seven in, in a package at a time. Then I can deal with them all at once as opposed to getting one, one week and I get one in three weeks and one in you know another three weeks. I'd rather have like a chunk hit at once, deal with it at one time, one hearing, and then, you know, quickly parse out what, what, what the next steps are at the level. So, you know, some extension orders are still waiting. Actually, most of my extension is still waiting in the Senate for approvals. House extension order requests are already waiting down the branch. And, um, you know, a modern economic development bill, the Economic, they, uh, Georgia economic Development and Emerging, Emerging Technologies has filed an extension on that bill. You know, so from my standpoint of my stuff, I'm kind of like in a frustrated holding pattern. Yeah, but, hurry up and wait. Hurry up and wait. And then you got the housing bond bill, though, that's floating around. You have an information technology bond bill floating around, too. So, you know, we got some other pieces that we're kind of keeping an eye on as just, you know, not any other member, uh, not a chair, because I don't chair those committees, just to you know, keep an eye on those things. So I'm not, saying, I'm not saying we're super busy, but once I get to like April, week of April 8th, we're going to go a little bonky for like six weeks. Yeah, you go zero to 100. <laughs> yeah, so as you can tell, I'm like taking advantage of a little bit of downtime to get my brain reset. Uh, as like mentally prepare myself for like wonky period where just everything's flying through the air and you got to keep track of where things are. And we may have the clerk's office do all the referrals in one day and suddenly the, our system lights up and says, hey, you know, all your stuff's here, then we got to move quick. Uh, so we're trying to beat the July 31st clock. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so enjoy the lull before the storm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, if you want a job that has like, you know, 95 consistency, Forget about going to events. Forget about you know the campaign. Forget about all that. Just the stay out part of the job. You know, want this consistency of nine to five. It's predictable. You know, you know how the day's going to go. I mean, this is not the life. Right. There right. are days where I'm doing like eleven hours of insanity, and you know, then you know, four days later, nothing's going on. Right. So um, you're going to visit the Korean consulate. You said. Yeah, I'm having dinner tonight uh, with the Korean consulate. We do uh, one or two, mostly two uh, meals a year. Uh, we get up a date on geopolitics uh, in the Korean Peninsula, but also talk about um, how you know what how's going on between you know Korean U.S. relations, Korean Massachusetts relations. Um, they like to get caught up on local politics as well. You know what's going on here. Um, you know we always have these you know very stimulating conversations about. Um, how the world's working and, and 
you know, what they're doing or what we're doing. Um, sometimes it's current events or sometimes we do some small talk. So uh, Council General Yoon has been here, um, I think it was appointed in, in September. So this will be my first meal with this Council General. It'll be the House Asian Caucus is invited tonight. And uh, well, it's really uh, an opportunity uh, to see how things are going on somewhere else and also mm -hmm. provide an outsider point of view of how they see how we're doing. They are prohibited from engaging in politics. They are also prohibited in, in uh, expressing too much opinion. Uh, but you know, they are more allowed to provide their analysis about you know what they see how things are going in Massachusetts and the United States. Yeah. So you know, it'll be a, it'll be a fun night. The Japanese constant does the same thing. Those two in particular like to keep regular contact with the Asian Caucus and and also us uh, as, as the state of Massachusetts. Um, they generally represent uh, five or six states. They sometimes get all of New England or sometimes Connecticut's part of North for whatever reason. So, yeah, I know. It's one of those things. So I don't decide how this works. It's their job, not mine. Right. Um, so we also get you know some knowledge about what's going on. Hey, I've been in Maine. This is what's going on in Maine. Oh, okay. Tell us what's happening. Right? And, and this is kind of part of the, the fun part of the movie, you know, to get to learn about other things. Um, yeah. So I can update you next time about how that dinner went. Maybe it was a very stimulating conversation, or maybe it's been very boring and nothing's going on. We either, either. So I'd be curious to also to see what they say about their relations with North Korea. Yeah, they do. Uh, they, they have a very strong interest in updating us with North Korea situation. Um, obviously, uh, as we talked about last call, this you know the U.S. presence in Asia is much greater than any. But he ever think about because you start really thinking way through it, it's pretty expensive, as well as the U.S. allies uh, from Australia to Korea, um, mm -hmm. strong win of, of U.S. allies. So, um, yeah, this is going to be, I mean, it'll be fun. And then, like I said, we'll do something with the Japanese down the road. Um, and we'll see what happens next. So, all righty. Uh, how do we get a hold of you, Jackie? Well, let me do one more quickie to updates. So oh, we sure. have two updates. Bill Driscoll, our good friend Bill Driscoll from Milton, is going to run for Senator Walter Timothy C. So our, our friend next door who chairs the emergency prep um, committee in the House, you know, is going to make a run for the Senate. As Walter Timothy is going to go run for clerk of courts in Norfolk County. And then His I father's went, old job. <laughs> yeah, the same name, folks. Different, different part of the family, but same name. Yeah, Walter C. and Walter Jr. And then, uh, you know, our longtime transportation chair, Bill Strauss, has decided to retire. So we made that announcement uh, on Friday. And again, all the speculation, what's going on. And, uh, as I like to say, I think the transportation chair is going to be one of those chairs that a lot of uh, other members are going to be clamoring to try to become chair at all. Right? It's one of those very popular chairmanships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, he was a transportation show when I got there 14 years ago. So he's been transportation show for a very, very, very long time. Hmm. So uh, by, by rough count, whether a midterm resignation or a uh, not running for office again, but, but I think I count four Republicans and 12 Democrats so far. Um, and I think we may be done. I think there may be a couple of left on my list as a possibility, but I think we're closing on, on finishing regarding uh, members leaving, unless a county seat becomes available, which again is so with Walter Timothy. Other parts of the state may have a, a change in county level, and you know, legislators may think about moving those jobs. Um, and some people may not realize this, but if you're like in Western Mass and you got a job that's like 10 minutes away from home, you're going to take that job and drive away three and about three and a half hours to Boston. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's that quality of life issue, depending where part of the state you live in. And uh, we tend to forget, since we're from Quincy, uh, Boston is, despite the traffic, you know, the T, it's not that far. Uh, right. But it's coming in from like Western Mass or deep in the Cape or, or parts of the Vermont border. Uh, yeah, it's it's a hike. So there's opportunity to run from uh, either local office or a county offices, you know, people, particularly those areas, take a strong look at that. It's, it's a, they really want to drive that far. 
Yeah, it's, and there's a cost factor too. Absolutely, yeah. Hmm. So, Lisa, we I think we're close to done. Um, and maybe I'll get surprised in the next couple of weeks of who else decides to not run for election or not run for election here and run for something else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Although the Quincy delegation is all running again, yes. Yeah, I got my nomination papers uh, going to the clerk's office and, uh, you know, I talked to Senator Keene and he's working on his and um, everyone else uh, has got to get their papers in. And we're pretty, I mean, I'm not very concerned that enough signature drives. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll get the minimum number plus a good buffer. Um, and also, you saw the Free Jacks on our social media. So, oh yes, congratulations, Free Jacks, on you know, their championship win last year, and uh, the, we had a fun time uh, everyone recognizing the state senate and taking a, a mini tour of the house chamber. And uh, obviously, the season is uh, underway, and we you know, wish them the best. So, uh, you know, hey, this is a little bit of fun things here, and we also had a, a, a appointment of the youth. Advisory Council for the Governor and uh, includes uh, one Quincy kid. And we got a few Quincy kids coming in for student government in the end of next week, April 4th. So, nice. yeah, so we well, we got some great things going on in the city, uh, you know, with youth and state government. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's always something for sure. And of course, next year will be the uh, Quincy 400 uh, celebration. Mm, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. So you tell me what's going to happen. As soon as I know, I'll, I'll let you know, Techie. <laughs> I got a lot. I, you know, no, I got a lot happening at, at one time. So Joe's going to have to uh, update me on what's going there. And then we, I'll question Joe about it. We got you covered. Not a problem. <laughs> so my phone number, folks, 617-722-2370. 617-722-2370. Uh, we are staffed. And uh, sometimes the person in the front desk gets overwhelmed. So... Please uh, remember, it's Jerry Paracella's office, not my office, who controls the suite. So you have to wait a little while to get through the prompts. Tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T-A-C-K-E-Y dot C-H-A-N at mahouse.gov. You know, please happy to email us. We do read our emails. I read my emails all day, all night. And then you know, categorize. We talked about constituent databases last time, so you know how I categorize things and what systems I use. Uh, and uh, we'll try to get back to you. If it's like a real emergency, obviously leave us a voicemail. Uh, the voicemails come to our emails, by the way. Just even, so we do see them that way, even if we're not in the office. Um, you know, we have a uh, state representative Tacky Chan. You can see free free jacks on my Facebook, as well as uh, at Tacky Chan on X. So you can see those uh, pictures of us and how uh, I'm out of place with these folks with a picture. Um, they're very tall men. They're very big. <laughs> they're they're pretty wide. Uh, it's it, you actually see them in person. You're like, wow, <laughs> you're pretty wide. Um, and then you got uh, State Representative Tacky Chen Facebook and Twitter, I talked about, or X. And then uh, MALegislature.gov. I very much encourage everyone to use MALegislature.gov. It's a great way to find your bills, as well as you know, watch past public hearings and get information about you know, the legislature. And uh, um, TackyChen.org is our reference page. You can find some useful phone numbers. And of course, you know, you and Joe and I are here every two or th one or two weeks, depending on our schedules. And, you can send Joe questions at QA TV if you want to have a special request with Joe. You know, to have something Joe. Don't let Joe pick the topic. How's that sound? Oh, neat. Okay. Fun. Yeah, you pick the topic and you tell Joe. Then, <laughs> um, of course, check in with Joe in the morning on you know AM Quincy to, to get your 10 minute spiel on what's going on in the world locally. So, no shortage of information, uh, information you get about the city, and no shortage of ways to reach us. That's right. It's the beauty of local access. We, uh, we're right here with you. Yeah, Joe, give everyone your email in the little bar later. <laughs> I will do that, but they can go right to our website and they can get me uh, get me that way too. So uh, or, I like snail mail. I'm old fashioned. So drop me a letter. Yeah, drop, drop, drop a letter. Uh, and uh, what? April Fool's is coming too, right? That's right. April Fool's Day. So, uh, you know, uh, everyone have a wonderful rest of March and uh, enjoy April Fool's Day. You know, some lighthearted humor, nothing mean. Uh, yeah, look out for kick me signs on my back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see what next week brings. But, you know, you all take care and you know, try to stay warm. Mm -hmm.